I'm holding in my hand the most sinister book ever written on witchcraft. It's called Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches, or in German, Der Hexenhammer. This particular copy is over four centuries old. Now, most of us don't read Latin. The original copy was printed in Latin, but I have a first edition, English edition, and over the next several weeks, I'm going to do a series of readings out of this book. Now, for some of you, that may be boring, so this isn't the video for you. But let me give you a little background first on what this book is. Madeleine's Malavacarum asserts that three elements are necessary for witchcraft. The evil intentions of the witch, the help of the devil, and the permission of God. Now, the book is divided into three sections, and I'm going to read the opening paragraphs of each of the sections shortly. The first section is aimed at clergy, and it tries to refute critics who deny that witchcraft was a reality. And the second section describes actual forms of witchcraft and its remedies. And the third section assists judges in confronting and combating witchcraft and to aid the inquisitors in removing the burden from them. Each of these sections has a prevailing theme of what witchcraft is and what is a witch. Now, in section one, it examines the concept of witchcraft theoretically. And I'm going to open this up. And here, here is the very beginning, part one. Malleus Maleficarum, or first part, treating of three necessary concomitants of witchcraft, which are the devil, a witch, and the permission of Almighty God. Part one, question one. Whether the belief that there is or are such a being as witches is so essential a uh, part of the Catholic faith that obstinately to maintain the opposite manifestly savors of heresy. So basically, if you didn't believe in witchcraft, that was heresy. Now, Heinrich Kramer, the priest who wrote this book, wanted to make it appear as if it had the authority of the Pope. Now, a couple of years earlier, he did get what is known as a papal bull. And if we go to the beginning of this book, that is the first thing that you will see um, right here. You'll see Pope Innocent the Eighth, and then right here, it has a copy of that. And in that, it talks about how witchcraft was evil and everything should be done to stop it. And he used that as justification um, to write this book. Now, back to chapter one. Moreover, no operation of witchcraft has a permanent effect on us. And this is the proof thereof, for if it were so, it would be affected by the operation of demons. But to maintain that the devil has power to change human bodies or to do them permanent harm does not seem in accordance with the teachings of the church. For in this way, they would destroy the whole world and bring it to utter confusion. Now, so this will go on for hundreds and hundreds of pages. But let's go, let's talk about uh, section one. So... Specifically, it addresses the, this idea of whether witchcraft was a real phenomenon or imaginary, or perhaps deluding phantasms of the devil, or simply the fantasies of overwrought human minds. The conclusion drawn is witchcraft must be real because the devil is real. Witches entered into a pact with Satan to allow them power to perform harmful magical acts, thus establishing an essential link between witches and the devil. So part one of this book, that's what it talks about. Part two, matters of actual cases are discussed 
and the powers of witches and their recruitment strategies. Let's go to part two. Now, this first video is just an overview. I, we will go into more depth on later videos. The second part, treating of the methods of which witchcraft is inflicted and how it may be auspiciously removed. The second main part of this work deals with the method of procedure adopted by witches for the performance of their witchcraft. And these are distinguished under 18 heads, proceeding from two chief difficulties. The first of these two, dealt with in the beginning, concerns protective remedies by which a man is rendered immune from witchcraft. A second dealt with at the end concerns curative remedies by which those who are bewitched can be cured. For as Aristotle says, prevention and cure are related to one another and are accidentally matters of causation. In this way, the whole foundation of this horrible heresy may be made clear. And in the above two divisions, the following points will be principally emphasized. First, the initiation of witches and their profession of sacrilege. Second, the progress of their method of working and their horrible observances. Third, the preventive protections against their witchcraft. And because they are now dealing with matters relating to morals and behavior, and there is no need for a variety of arguments and disquisitions, since those matters which now follow under their headings are sufficiently discussed in the foregoing question. Therefore, pray God that the reader will not look for proofs in every case, since it is enough to adduce examples that have been personally seen or heard or are accepted as the word of credible witnesses. And in the first of these points mentioned, two matters will be chiefly examined. First, the various methods of enticement adopted by the devil himself. Second, the various ways in which witches profess their heresy. And in the second of the main points, six matters will be examined in order relating to the procedure of witchcraft and its cure. First, the practices of witches with regard to themselves and their own bodies. Second, their practices with regard to other men. Third, those relating to beast. Fourth, the mischief they do with the fruits of the earth. Fifth, those kinds of witchcraft which are practiced by men only and not by women. Sixth, the question of removing witchcraft and how those who are bewitched may be cured. Now... And the conclusion drawn is that witchcraft must be real because the devil is real. Witches entered into a pact with Satan to allow them to the power to perform magical acts, thus establishing an essential link between witches and the devil. And the second part details how witches cast spells and remedies that can be taken. So that'll be the second part. And finally, the third part is the legal part of Malleus Maleficarum and it discusses how to prosecute a witch. And the arguments are so clearly laid out that it makes it quite, it makes it easier for those if it's their first time to do this. Let's read what the beginning chapters of section three, just to give you an idea. So the third part relating to the judicial proceedings in both the ecclesiastical and civil courts against witches and indeed all heretics. The question is whether witches, together with their patrons and protectors and defenders, are so entirely subject to the jurisdiction of the diocesan ecclesiastical court and the civil court so that the inquisitors of the crime of heresy can altogether be relieved from the duty of sitting in on judgment upon them. And it is argued that this is so. Certainly those whose high privilege is to judge concerning matters of faith ought not to be distracted by other business. And inquisitors deputed by the apostolic see to inquire into the pest of heresy should manifestly not have to concern themselves with diviners and soothsayers unless they are also heretics, nor should it be their business to punish such. But they may leave them to be punished by their own judges." Nor does there seem to be any difficulty in the fact that the heresy of witches is not mentioned in that canon, 
For these are subject to the same punishment as others in the court of conscience, as the canon goes on to say, If the sin of diviners and witches is secret, the penance of forty days shall be opposed, imposed upon them. If it is notorious, they shall be refused the Eucharist, and those whose punishment is identical should receive it from the same court. Then again, the guilt of both being the same, since just as soothsayers obtain their results by curious means, so do witches look for and obtain from the devil the injuries which they do to creatures, unlawfully seeking from his creatures that which should be sought from God alone. Therefore, both are guilty of the sin of idolatry. And so I've only read about six paragraphs out of about 3,000. Um, it's a fascinating subject. And like I said, section three, this third part, it does a step-by-step -step as far as initiating the processes, assembling accusations to the interrogation and torture of the witnesses and formal charging of the accused. And one little note, women who did not cry during their, during their trial, trial were automatically believed to be witches. Now, I have two of these ancient copies of Malleus Maleficarum and I have two of the original English editions I'm going to, not going to read it entirely, but each video I will try to give, read a few interesting paragraphs out of parts one, parts two, and parts three, so you can get an idea of the flow of what is going on. And I think it's quite interesting that it was the printing press. In 1450, Johannes Gutenberg, the press, and within three decades, they're printing this book on witches and um, basically how to basically squash this what they considered evil practice that was uh, among the people at the time um, and like I said I'm don't consider myself an expert on the subject I track down rare books and documents I just happen to be in the fortunate position to be able to find these rare books and documents and find things that aren't readily available, not even on the internet. And so hopefully you'll find this interesting and I look forward to seeing you um, at the next video. Be sure to subscribe so you know when the next one's out. Moon's Rare Books.